welcome back to the Cruel Room. We're here once again in this wonderful ranty room for all things Formula One. And the Monaco Grand Prix has finally, finally come to a close after multiple red flags, formation laps behind safety car. Oh, it's a bit wet, it's sprinkling with rain. I don't think we should start on time. And an hour and four minutes after the race was due to start, it finally started behind safety car. Fantastic stuff. We got there in the end, didn't we? And I'd just like to make a special note to the FIA. They're not getting a Palmer of the Week, but they are very close. This is their one fuck up I'm allowing. Yes, it rained. Yes, it was a deluge. Yes, you might have had to red flag it. Yes, there might have been a car stuffed in the wall. But you could have started that race on time. We'd have had a mix of tyres. Apparently there was some on Inters, some on medium tyres, some on hard tyres, some on full wets. It was a right variety of, of, of strategies out there. And that would have been an exciting start to the Monaco Grand Prix. But no, we were denied it on the grounds of safety. However, these are meant to be the 20 best drivers in the world. Well, 19 and Latifi. But you know what I mean. You know what I mean. These are supposed to... It's supposed to be the pinnacle of motorsport, this. With the greatest teams, the greatest drivers. Throw anything at them. They can handle it. You know, and... That we just had all this nonsense. Apparently, actually, there was a power cut in the FIA uh, control room prior to the race start, and that's actually why they delayed the start. And then the rain came, so they just continued to delay it. Not sure how true that is, but nonetheless, it would have been quite funny if that did happen, that they had to delay the start because of something that happened, and then they had to just continually delay it to make it look like it was a rain to correct a fuck-up. Anyway, that's enough of that. So, if you've never seen this series before, I award the drivers out of a maximum 10 points based on their race weekend's results, and I go all the way down to zero if you have a particularly bad one. I do award bonus points if someone does something extra special during the race, and sometimes minus points are on offer for those that do extra special for all the wrong reasons. So, let's take a look at the current Cruel Room standings. They're on the screen now for you. Take a look, have a look, and see who's on top, who's down at the bottom. Can you see any risers, any fallers based on this weekend? We're going to go through them one by one and assess each driver's race weekend, and that table, I'm sure, will mix up a lot. So... We're going to kick things off with the race winner, Marcus Ericsson. What a fantastic effort, Marcus. I am so, so chuffed for him. Indy 500 winner. Fantastic stuff. It's two fingers up to Formula One. It really is. Fair play, Marcus Ericsson. He has done so well since leaving Formula One. Took, took him a couple of years to adapt to IndyCar, but I think this is his third win now. And the big one, the Indy 500. I've also heard he's leading the championship in the Indy Series now as well, which is unbelievable stuff. So it proved he had the talent, it proved he had the ability, he just needed the car and the right team. And there he is, delivering. So congratulations, Marcus Ericsson. I wish I could score your points, but I really can't. But a fantastic effort nonetheless. Well done, Marcus. It deserved a special shout-out on the Cruel Room. And I'm very, very happy for you. So well done, Marcus Ericsson. So let's kick things off with the actual race winner, Checo, Sergio Perez. Fantastic stuff, Sergio. I am so, so happy for you. And again, another two fingers up to Red Bull. Oh, can you get out of the way, please? Max is a bit faster. He's got on fresher tyres. He's not in our fight. That's what it all was about, wasn't it, in Spain? Get out of the way. You've not even got a chance to fight, Max. And here we are, Sergio Perez are winning the race with a Ferrari in between Max, so they couldn't reverse them round that time. What a fantastic effort, Perez. He had the pace all weekend, though. He was looking comfortable in the car once again, wasn't he? He wasn't struggling. He was always within a tenth of his teammates, sometimes even faster. Qualifying was a little bit of a shame they had that incident at the end, but he was just pushing that little bit too hard to try and get a front row start. Maybe a pole, but those Ferraris were looking really strong in qualifying. I think they might have been able to jump science, but... I do believe Charles was genuinely untouchable for the pole. Having said that, Checo put it into the wall. That was the only thing that went wrong this weekend. The rest of it was perfect. He went on the Inters first. That leapfrogged him ahead of everyone else. Max, Sainz and Leclerc. And he led the race from then on. They went onto the medium compound tyres after the red flag, didn't they? After Max, uh, after Mick Shunt. Um, and yeah, it was. he just did really well. He, the, you could see the tyres were falling away, weren't they, at the end? But... He held off. It was Monaco, of course. I know it was Monaco. Really difficult to overtake. But 
fair play to Sergio Perez. He thoroughly deserved that victory and climbs within 15 points now of uh, Max Verstappen. So he is a title contender and I don't want to see any more team orders now because it would be absolute bullshit now if any more were to come from here on in when he's only 15 points within the gap. That's a race victory. That's a podium. And, you know, anything can change, as we can see. So, for Sergio Perez, it's going to be a maximum score of 10 points. It would have been maybe an 11 or a 12, but I do have to consider that crash in qualifying. So, you know, I do I do blame him and I don't blame him. He is thoroughly deserving of the 10 points. And I am so, so happy to see him take his third victory in Formula 1 around the streets of Monaco. Fantastic stuff, Sergio. You deserve that, especially after Spain. You've reasserted yourself in Red Bull's uh, good books. And, in theory... Just sign him up now. Just sign him up now, Red Bull. Who are you waiting for to get good? Because no one else is ready. You're never going to put Gasly back in that car again, are you? So, you need to re-sign him, realistically. But yeah, for now, a full 10 points to Checo Perez. Fantastic stuff. Next up is, of course, Carlos Sainz. And it's a day for the number two drivers, isn't it? It's Carlos Sainz finishing in second place ahead of his teammate, Shalala. And again, a fantastic fantastic race by Carlos Sainz and what made it extra special was he didn't listen to his Ferrari strategist he went no I am not pitting for intermediate tyres I'm staying on these wet tyres until I need to go onto the slicks he did just that and this is why he stays P2 a fantastic effort had he come in for the inters and then the slicks he would have certainly been behind um Perez, as he was anyway, that was just a stunning outlap by Perez on those Inters that got him that position, really. Uh, for Carlos Sainz, though, had he gone Inters then onto the hard tyres, he could have ended up fourth. So, we'll wait. We're never going to know. We're never going to know, but it would have certainly compromised him, and he played a blinder by not listening to Ferrari. And for Carlos Sainz, there's, there's not a lot that can be said. There's so much went on, but not a lot at the same time. It was a really, really weird way, race. But for Carlos Sainz, a fantastic effort. Fully deserving of 10 points and a big boost to his confidence. Is the bridesmaid again not quite getting the victory and just that close to, to succeeding. But that is racing. But a huge boost to his confidence after, let's be honest, a shite last few races. A shite last few races. They have not been good at all and not what Ferrari expected or Sainz. But today he delivered, delivered well. But I'm sure the victory now, hopefully after this confidence boost in Monaco, is not too far away. We'll wait and see what the next race brings for him. But for now, 10 points on the Krull Room. Fantastic stuff. Carlos Sainz. In third place, it is, of course, Max Verstappen, Checo's teammate. Third place. He is the number two driver this race. He drove really well, to be fair to Max. He was unlucky in qualifying to get blocked by, of course, Checo's crash and Science crashing into him. Um, it was unfortunate. He did match Leclerc's sector one time, so it could have been a front row start. That could have changed the dynamic of the race. But at the same time, if it was the lead car, it could have all gone so wrong. Could have all gone so wrong. So, yeah, Max, he didn't look as comfortable as Checo all race weekend long, although he did look to have the overall pace. It was only just by that much and fractionally and the slightest error meant it was behind him and you know it was it was a good race weekend by um, Max of course extending his championship lead but at the same time it wasn't the best we've seen of him he didn't look 100% comfortable in the car like we've seen in previous races so for Max Verstappen it's going to be eight points on the crawl room to him qualifying fourth which should have maybe been third or second but we're never going to know. That's Monaco. That's racing. Should have got his lap in earlier. And in the race, good strategy. Netted himself a podium. Job done. Job done. Championship lead extension. Just nothing special. Eight points on the crawl room to Max Verstappen. And then we come to Shalala. It's a bittersweet symphony that's life. And it certainly is bittersweet for... Charles Leclerc because he has never ever ever finished a race at his home circuit and today he finishes a race so he should in theory be happy but he's devastated and understandably so Ferrari got it oh so wrong oh so wrong with that strategy he ends up finishing P4 after a stunning pole position lap time after leading the first part of the race and then when it came to pit stops, it just all went so, so wrong. Box, 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 stay out, stay out, stay out. Oh, he's in the fucking pit lane. Oh, we've fucked that one up, lads, haven't we? Ferrari can always snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. And once again, the Ferrari strategy team lets him down and just reacts too slowly to what's going on around them. 
Big, big shame. Big, big shame for Charles Leclerc. But at least he's got a finish under his belt, so next year he can win it. I was rooting for him. I really was. Um, it wasn't nice to see. I was devastated for him. And what can I do? It was it was all going so, so well. So, for Sha La La, I'm going to award him nine points. And everyone's going to say that's really, really harsh because he didn't do anything wrong. And he didn't do. He didn't do anything wrong. But at the end of the day, science called his own strategy. And he finished second. Had Leclerc maybe listened to his own instincts a little bit more as opposed to relying on the team that we do know screw up with strategies so, so much and have done in the past. If he'd have gone, I want to do what science is doing or no, I'm going to wait. If he'd have listened to himself maybe as opposed to the team, it could have still won today. So I'm just knocking a point off for what could have been if it had just maybe been assertive like science was. There we go. That's all I'm going to say on that. But I don't blame him at all. And I am genuinely gutted for Charles. So a good race overall for us to watch. But I was really gutted for Charles. So yeah, nine points on the cruel room. And then we come to George, George, George of the Russell. Watch out for that top five. Here he is once again finishing in P5. Fantastic effort. Once again qualifying P6. And got ahead of Norris in the strategy. So a good call by Mercedes there to pop him ahead of Norris in the McLaren. And then, yeah, he was getting hunted down by Norris at the end, who elected to stop again for fresh medium tyres and finished at three tenths ahead. So it was really close at the end, and maybe another lap we could have seen Norris nip round him, but it went down to timings in the end, didn't it? A timed session at the end. But, yeah, I mean, for George Russell, it's nine points on the crawl room. Uh, you know, he, he's just doing so, so well this year. It's, it's just... Oh, the only driver to finish inside the top five in all the races, and you've got the likes of Ferrari and Red Bull, the dominant two, you're thinking, well, they should at least be all, all races on the podium, but it's not. It's crazy up top. Mr. Consistency, George Russell picking up 10 points, 12 points, 15 points every single race. If, if Mercedes find a magic solution overnight, he could easily be in championship contention, so... Fair play to George, he is doing an incredible job this year and he thoroughly deserves 9 points on the Cruel Room and he deserves a lot of praise from Mercedes once again for a fantastic drive. And in P6 as mentioned is Lando, Lando Norris, what a cracking drive by Lando, qualifying P5, finishing finish P6 and then stopping for the mediums at the end to absolutely hunt down, hunt down George Russell to try and find a way to overtake him after losing out into the first round of pit stops. And you know what? Lando Norris still not 100% after tonsillitis. I didn't realise he actually had tonsillitis until after I recorded the previous Cruel Room. So I felt that eight was harsh actually, but that's life. I get things wrong at times and that's just that. But this weekend again, he said he's still not feeling 100%, but a lot, lot better. And if you can feel a lot, lot better than you were at Spain, he delivered a cracking result once again. So for Lando Norris, everything's been said about him. Just stunning once again. Sorts out the men from the boys, does Monaco. And we've got the Chargers there, haven't we? We've got George there. We've got Lando there. The future is there on the brink of absolutely amazing stuff. So it's just thrilling to see. So for Lando Norris, it's nine points on the cruel room to him as well. Stunning, stunning effort. And uh, yeah... Great stuff, great result once again and some more solid points for the McLaren team as well as bagging fastest lap as well. Just get that in at the end there. He did bag the fastest lap point, didn't he? After he did stop that second time. So congratulations, Lando Norris. And then it's Fernando Alonso. Here he is finishing in a lonely P7. Well, I say lonely. He just, I don't know what happened to him really. He did. He drove well to start with. He was on a good strategy. He got himself up to P7. And then the red flag came out for Mick. He went out on the medium tyres and he just drove so slowly. So slowly. He was 3.6 seconds a lap slower than the leader. He was in P7. So he was holding everyone up behind him because he was just conserving his tyres to try and push at the end to try and get fastest lap. That's what Alpine have said. But at the same time, it bottled Ocon's strategy up because Ocon ended up with the five second time penalty and had the points as a result. So I'm not really sure what happened there. But yeah, anyway, he drove well. He drove really, really well. But it did frustrate me how slow he was driving because that that was borderline on sportsmanship. And I know it's to conserve your own points and there's no point pushing too hard and tagging a wall. I completely get that. But when you're lapping 3.6 seconds off the pace every single lap, 
and then just pushing towards the end. It was it was frustrating to see, and it was it wasn't it was a good exciting watch because there was a long train of cars, but at the same time, all those cars behind had just been hampered and hindered by a slow moving Alonso. So for that reason, it's nine points to Alonso. I am being gen I'm being generous there because I were going to award him a full ten because I thought he drove really well, but I've knocked that point off for driving far too slow. Of course, you can set the pace. That is the luxury of Monaco. But I thought it was a little bit excessive at times. And it was frustrating. It was frustrating to watch. And I can't imagine what the teams behind must have been thinking. But at the same time, he hindered his own teammate as well. So it was just all a bit bizarre. And yeah, nine points to Alonso. A great drive. A really good drive. But ooh, going slow did annoy me a little bit. And next up is Lewis Hamilton, possibly one of the most unluckiest drivers on the grid this weekend, apart from, of course, Shalala. Uh, what could be said, he was improving his lap time, and then, of course, the crash for Perez in that Q3 meant he couldn't actually improve and start a P8. Again, like I said, with Max, though, he should have got his lap in first time around, like George did and like Lando did. But, you know, that's life, that's it. And then he stopped for the intermediate tyres and got caught up behind Esteban Ocon, didn't he? Who was on the extreme wets and was refusing to pit and refusing to move out of the way. And that meant that his inters tyres never got any advantage. He didn't gain anything out of going onto those intermediate tyres. Because once he called to Ocon, he was running on someone on knackered extreme wets pace. So got balled up behind him, had a couple of little fisty cuffs with him, didn't he? In the end, that's what got Oak on the five-second time penalty because he was a little bit too rough with Hamilton. And, uh, you know, it was getting borderline, moving, weaving, cutting in, chopping in. Ocon got really desperate for no good reason, to be honest, because he wasn't in the race at that point. Of course, it had helped Alonso further ahead that he was holding uh, Hamilton up. But at that point, Alonso was behind. It was, it was all a bit topsy-turvy, but I know he was trying to hold the, him up for his own team's benefit, but... Again, just a little bit too much, a little bit too extreme by Ocon. And then in the race, he got stuck behind Alonso, as mentioned, who was lapping 3.6 seconds a lap slower, and it just ruined his race. So, yeah, for uh, Lewis Hamilton, it's going to be seven points on the crawl room. And, uh, yeah, it might, might be a harsh seven, that. It really might be considering what he had to put up with. Uh, but at the same time, if he'd just got his lap together in qualifying on that first push lap in Q3, he could have been up there with George and he could have been fighting for P5. So, you know, not a great season by uh, Hamilton's standards. Certainly all the bad luck is falling his way at the moment. And yeah, just a, a poor a poor Monaco showing. Uh, I don't blame him at all really for it. I just think it was the look of the traffic and everything like that. The strategy not working out quite right. And having incredibly slow Alpines in front of him. But that's racing. And uh, sometimes you've got to put yourself in a situation, haven't you? And unfortunately, he put himself in the situation where he was stuck behind the Alpines he should have been ahead of. So, seven points on the cruel room to Lewis Hamilton. Next up is Valtteri Bottas, and a great drive by Valtteri. A qualified P12, so I was disappointed to miss out on Q3, but... The, the Alfa Romeo was looking to be struggling, wasn't it? They just couldn't eke that extra bit out in that second push lap in the qualifying session. So it was really actually, in theory, I was happy that he got he got P12 because a lot of the time he was on the verge, wasn't he? He was like 14th, 15th. So good that he started 12th. Really happy with that for him. And then in the race, it was a good strategy call. It was good pace by Bottas. Got him up into P10. And then the, of course, penalty, five-second time penalty for Esteban Ocon puts him here in P9. So fair play to Valtteri Bottas. Once again, delivering the goods for Alfa Romeo, scoring points in every race he's finished so far, I think. If I'm right in saying that, I might be incorrect with that. But either way, he's been really close to him. If not, that is fact. I'm not too sure. But stunning effort once again. And it's eight points on the board to Valtteri Bottas, another cracking drive, drove sensibly, drove quietly, didn't see much of him, but that's because he was just doing the job and not doing it spectacularly, just keeping out of trouble. And that's all that Alfa Romeo want from him. They're paying him to pick up the points, and that's what he's doing, getting a nice healthy gap over Haas, getting a nice healthy gap over Aston Martin, and of course Williams behind, and he's just picking up the points, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. Alpha Tauri not scoring this weekend as well, closes the gap to them. He's doing a fantastic job, and he has really come alive since leaving Mercedes. I'm going to keep saying that all season, because you can tell the difference. And... Nice ass as well, Valtteri. That was a wonderful photo of you in the uh, water there with the uh, wa water rippling over your cheeks. Needless to say, that certainly is my screensaver now on my phone. Oh, ho, ho, you saucy bastard, Valtteri. Eight points to you on the Krull Room. 
Next up, we come to Sebastian Vettel, the last of the points finishers, courtesy of Esteban Ocon's five second time penalty, dropping him out of the points. P11 man Vettel picks up one solitary point for the Aston Martin squad. And a great, great effort. Fair play, Sebastian Vettel drove really, really, really well. Uh, he was one of the first to stop for the Inters, if I remember rightly, and then one of the first to stop for the slick tyres. Uh, he drove really well in qualifying as well, didn't he? Fantastic effort by him in there. And he's just had a perfect weekend. If I seem to remember and seem to recall, he had... I seem to remember watching a replay where he had one wide moment somewhere or a cut across a chicane. Um, but nonetheless, apart from that, it was a faultless weekend and picked up a well-deserving one point for Aston Martin. I'm sure they'll be happy with that. There's nothing to really celebrate, but at the, t at the current climate, they'll take it. And so for Sebastian Vettel, it's a full ten points. Thoroughly deserving of 10 points, I feel, in my opinion. It was a really nice drive, really clever, really smart, a bit like Valtteri. Didn't see much of him because he wasn't getting involved in other people's problems, just keeping himself tidy. Yeah, benefited from Ocon's penalty, but Ocon shouldn't have been too rough. You know, Sebastian picked his fights, picked them well, picked up a point. Fantastic effort. Well done, Seb. 10 points to you. And then just outside the points, it's Pierre Gasly in the Alpha Tower. And whoa, what could be said for Pierre? He was out in Quali 1, wasn't he? He had a lot of traffic on a lap. And if I remember, there was a little mistake by him as well. And he was down in P16, knocked out by his teammate in Q1, actually. Um, they, they got the strategy wrong, didn't they? Like, they crossed the line, the Alpha Tower is, with not enough time to do another lap. But... Everyone else was still just starting their lap as they finished theirs and the track was bedding in, bedding in, bedding in. And it really, really, really was a massive, massive mistake by the Alpha Tower squad to do that. And Pierre Gasly not able to get a really quick lap time in. So started down in P17, P16. Either way, he was out in Q1. And here he is, just missing out on the points. Now, we've not seen anything special by Gasly this year so far, in my personal opinion, anyway. We've, we've not seen much from him. But I think that's more down to the car. But this weekend, I think we've seen a lot from him. I think he drove really well. First to pit on the inters. First to go for the slick tyres. And just to miss out on points by that much was a shame. But he got stuck in the end. He couldn't make any further progress because all the cars he were picking off was as a result of strategy. We saw some fantastic overtakes from him as well, didn't we? When he was the first to go onto the inters to overtake... Uh, was he, who was he overtook? Was it Stroll and Latifi and Albon? And we saw moves in places we never normally see moves around Monaco. And he was a thrill to watch, but eventually just got stuck and just got short of scoring a well-earned point, it would have been. So for Pierre Gasly, it's going to be 9.5 on the crawl room. 9.5. I know it's people might think that's completely generous on the... And do you know what? Maybe it is by a point. But I think he drove impeccably well and incredibly well. Drove smart, drove smooth, drove clean. Did some fantastic overtakes in that early phase. He made the decision to go on to the Inters at the start, which gained him all those places. And he thoroughly deserves... The, he deserves 9.5. Not quite a perfect 10, but yeah. Alpha Tauri got the strategy wrong in qualifying. And he manages to somehow recover from that. It's just a shame he didn't get the points at the end. But well done to Pierre Gasly. Cracking effort. 9.5. To you. And then we come to Esteban Ocon after crossing the line ninth. Here he is finally finishing in 12th position. Uh, it, was a, it was a rough race weekend for him, wasn't it? It was certainly a rough one. Qualifying was decent. The race at the start was decent. And then he stayed out on the extreme wets. Was too harsh with Hamilton. There were some really dodgy things there with the contacts and pushing him into the wall. And it was all just a bit unnecessary for that stage of the race. And picked up a five second time penalty, which is deservedly so. Got stuck behind his teammate, Alonso, that was driving like the, like the speed of a fucking bus. So, you know, some of that was all down to Alonso as well, driving too slow why he couldn't break away. And then when ha Alonso finally did break away, Hamilton didn't bother following him. And just, he got stuck behind Hamilton. And then all the bottleneck of cars behind meant that five seconds was a big, big penalty from P9 down to P12. For Esteban Ocon, it's a middle of the road, five points to him. Uh, I don't want to be too harsh on him because... Points, he finished in the points, he finished inside the points. The five second time penalty was deserved, however. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, had he maybe not done what he did do with Hamilton, Hamilton would have been ahead of Alonso. And you've got to look at it from a team perspective. Ocon played a good team game, uh, gained Alonso two points, but he lost himself two points. So, yeah, 
A bit of an up and down race weekend for Ocon. I don't think it was the worst performer out there. He's had a cracking season so far. Uh, but this one was just a bit of a miss. So yeah, five points to Esteban Ocon. Don't want to criticise him too much, but certainly not his best performance this year. Next up, of course, we have Daniel Ricciardo. <laughs> Have you heard? I'm coming back to F1. I'm taking Ricardo's place because no one would know the difference. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. It's been a long time coming, that hasn't it? It has been a long, long time coming. There's been certain races he has dodged the Palmer. This one he couldn't, could he? A big shunt in practice, uh, crap in qualifying, and pee nowhere in the race throughout the entirety. Just... <sighs> I don't know what's happening. He's been asking questions. Oh, where do you see yourself next year? And he's like, oh, I don't know. We're in talks. And then someone politely reminded him that he has actually got a contract for next year with, with McLaren, which even I didn't realise. And he was like, so yeah, I, I've answered a question right there that you don't really need to ask. And like, yeah, true, Daniel Rick, Danny Rick. But yeah, what a shame. Just what a shame. It's just gone nowhere. He's gone from being one of the most desired drivers on the grid. When McLaren signed him, everyone was thinking, shit, they've got a really strong driver pairing. And it's just not come together for Danny Rick at all, has it? And this season especially. I mean, last year, he blew hot and cold, didn't he? Monza, of course, being the big talking point last year. But, uh, no, you know, a couple of faults and fits there as well in the season. So, there were flashes of brilliance. But this year, where's the brilliance? Where is... It's, it's nowhere. It is absolutely nowhere. He is, he is nowhere. So... Palmer of the Week, a long overdue Palmer of the Week, I'd like to add, for Daniel Ricciardo. A race weekend to forget once again. Another Monaco Grand Prix to forget as well for the guy that's apparently the master around here, the king, the guy that got redemption. And now I think he's looking for a, an exit of Formula One because I can't see McLaren keeping him. I can't really see Ricardo wanting to stay either, if I'm honest. And it's just a, just all a bit sad. But there we go. Palmer of the Week to Daniel Ricciardo. Next up we come to Glance Stroll and what could be said for Lance, it was a bit of a anonymous race weekend wasn't it? He crashed, uh, well I say he crashed, he tagged the wall uh, on the reconnaissance laps or the formation laps before the race finally got underway. Uh, he, yeah, it was, he got himself a puncture then pitted for wets again which I don't think was right, he should have gone to the Inters there but that was a team call. And then just didn't make his way through, stayed down at the back of the grid. And that was that, couldn't couldn't do anything. The team couldn't get him up there, he couldn't get himself up there further up the field. And here he is finishing in P14. So it's just three points to Stroll. Vettel's had a cracking weekend. Stroll again, an, an anonymous shit one. I mean, how long is his dad going to keep him there? Let's be real, how long is his dad going to keep him there? That was, uh, that was fairly pathetic, that. But there we go, Stroll always does shit around Monaco. And once again, he's done shit again. So, there we go. Three points to Lance Stroll. And then we come to the second Canadian. It is Nicholas Latifi. And I was so, so close to giving him a Palmer when he crashed on that formation lap. A bit like Stroll did. But I let Stroll off, so I thought I've got to let Latifi off. Uh, but nothing special, was it? Nothing special at all, I'm afraid. Uh, should he have got a Palmer? He's probably escaped it, to be fair. But there was worse drivers out there. And Ricardo's overdue one. So, you know, what... What what can we say? What can we say? He's escaped to Palmer, but he's towards the bottom of the pecking order anyway. So, yeah, two points to Latifi. Uh, fairly crap re weekend, but he didn't have a massive crash, did he? Didn't have a big error, didn't have a big mistake. He just slid off, tagged the wall, changed his wing, and off he went again. And was just lacklustre, but wasn't being a shunter. So, praising in that sense. If it had gone off again, I certainly would have given him a Palmer, but he didn't. So, two points to Latifi. And uh, that's the end of that. In 16th place, we have Zhou Guan Yu. And another one that was close to getting a Palmer. Because once again, he doesn't deliver. Qualifying was unlucky. Qualifying one was unlucky for him. He couldn't set a proper representative lap time. He had traffic on one lap. He made a mistake on another lap. And then when he went out again, he couldn't get out across the line in time. With just a couple of minutes remaining on the clock. Due to Sonoda tagging the wall. And he just lined up 20th, so he didn't make really any headway. He tried overtaking Sonoda later in the race, managed to correct a really impressive slide, but he shouldn't have been sliding in the first place. Um, yeah, one point to show, and once again, the hopes of Bahrain, where he scored that point and then came so close to points in the other couple of races that followed. His P Anonymous once again, and Alfa Romeo 
must be starting to ask questions now and be thinking shit you know like i do i do rate joe and i do think he's a nice guy and everything but they need more they need more than just one driver scoring points and i don't expect anyone to be doing the job that bottas is doing but at least scrape a point at least get the point you know get 10th get 10th the car's capable of just picking up a point every race even if you're not the world's best driver so yeah joe it's one point avoids a palmer just again just avoids a palmer uh but yeah joe one point to you next up of course we have yuki sonoda <laughs> I'm now training to be a chef. I've not set anything on fire yet, but I did crash my Renault Clio through the kitchen. Whoops. There we go. Another lacklustre race weekend once again by Yuki. What a shame. He's not delivering, is he? Uh, qualifying hit the wall, caused the red flag, which in turn hampered his own teammate Gasly. Uh, he got through into Q2, but then didn't progress any further. Gasly was out in Q1. And then in the race, it looked to go well at the start, didn't it? Strategy didn't work out too well. And then in the end, he just kept sending it down slip road after slip road. It was off the track, on the track, back off the track. It was yellow flags and it was always Yuki Tsunoda down the slip road, wasn't it? So it just didn't work out well at all, did he? And once again, just pee nowhere. Gasly made, climbed his way through the field. Tsunoda tumbled backwards and in the end, the sort of finish where each other started in the race. So polar opposites, really. And yeah, has to be a Palmer for Yuki. What a shame. And yeah, it's 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 a tough one, isn't it? It really is a tough one now for Red Bull to decide what they're doing with Yuki. Because he's not delivered. But then again, Gasly's not really been delivering the last few races. At least Sonoda picked up a point last race out. So it's just all difficult, isn't it? Difficult is the world of Formula 1. But all I know is that Sonoda really didn't deliver this weekend. Every yellow flag seemingly was for him sending it down a slip road or spinning it or going over a kerb. So yeah. There we go. Yuki Tsunoda, Palmer of the Week. And then we come to the first of the retirements, the last on this list, of course. It is Alexander Albon. And what a shame for Alex. Just missed out on Q2, which was highly, highly disappointing. In the race, looked to have a good start, was doing all right. And then just, I think he must have tagged the wall. He got a puncture, fell behind his teammate Latifi, and then just couldn't make any progress from the back and last and in the end, he retired the car. I'm not sure what the issue was in the end, but nonetheless, he was out of the race. And a big shame by Alexander Albon. Once again, two races in a row where it's gone wrong for Alex. Big, big shame. But once again, we've got a couple of races ahead now, which I think he'll look forward to him and do really well at. Monaco, not really going to be a great circuit for a Williams anyway, is it? So for Alexander Albon, for a retirement, as you all know, I can only score a maximum of five points. That's the rules I set myself, just so it keeps the it fair between, you know, retirements, etc. and mechanical problems. And yeah, so for uh, Alexander Albon, the maximum five I can give him, I'm going to award him three, because it wasn't special up until the retirement, was it? And the puncture and... It was just all a bit of a shame. So, yeah, I do love you, Alex, but, again, a little bit of an off weekend and just three points to you. Then we come to the Haas pairing and we start, of course, with Mick Schumacher. At least my F1 career lasted longer than Marzi spins. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. Palmer of the week once again to Mick. What a mess. What a mess. Oh, God. What a shame. I don't even know what to say, to be honest. He just ripped his car in half, didn't he, again? Another massive bill for Haas. This is not what they want. They need to be spending that money on development, not fixing the car that's already there. Oh, Mick. Really struggling for words for Mick now. I thought he'd do well this year. I'm not saying Monaco would have netted him any spectacular result or points, but I certainly wasn't expecting him to be sending it into the wall and ripping his car in half once again. Big shame. Big, big shame. Mick didn't deliver in qualifying. Anonymous in the race until that point. And then snapped his car in half. Yeah, so Mick Schumacher, Palmer of the Week. Again. Last but by no means least, we of course come to Mick's teammate, Kevin Magnussen, the first of the retirements in the race. Uh, was it a water pressure issue in the end which sent him out of the race? We didn't even realise he'd retired. Uh, I looked at the bottom of the screen just before Mick crashed. I was like, oh, when did K-Mag go out? Um, 
Again, K-Mag, it was a pretty lonely race for him, pretty anonymous, but he went out before the phases of the pit stops, before the red flag that Mick caused, of course, and we couldn't really see what he could deliver, what Haas could deliver, what strategies that were going to be going on, etc. And so for that reason, for Kevin Magnussen, it's going to be a middle-of-the-road five, the maximum I can score a retirement, as already mentioned. Uh, I think he could have done well. I'm not saying it was going to be points, but he could have been on the verge there with Ocon's time penalty. He was racing around the likes of Vettel anyway, wasn't he? So you never know. But it was too early to judge that he was out of the race long before we got into the exciting things of pit stop windows, pit stop phases, etc. And we just couldn't see what Hassa's strategy was capable of or what Kevin was capable of. So that's why it's just the middle of the road five to Kevin Magnussen. So there we have it guys, those were the runners and riders of the Monaco Grand Prix. Let me know your thoughts and feedback down below. Did I score any drivers too high, any too low? The updated Cruel Room scoreboard is on the screen now with all the lovely points that I have just awarded for this Monaco Grand Prix. As always, a massive thank you to Dan Mushy Gaming for producing this Cruel Room for me and keeping a track of the scores because without him, this series would be more pointless than it already is. And who can forget Dave, F1 Games PlayStation, for providing me with the Jolie and Palmer skits that you all know and love by now. I've used another three, Dave. I think I'm getting ready for a few more. So before the scoreboard goes off, just take a quick look again. Have a look up and down the field. Where's your favourite driver? Who are you rooting for this year on the Cruel Room Championship as well? It's taking sh shape nicely. The, the top drivers are at the top. The bottom are at the bottom now. It's all starting to break away. We're starting to see a, a trend between the drivers, a pattern forming. So yeah, be sure to let me know who you're rooting for on the Cruel Room Championship this year. And as always, I'll see you all in two weeks' time for the Canadian Grand Prix, I believe it is. I think Canada's back at last, isn't it? I love Canada. Cannot wait. And thank you so, so much for watching. And as always, much love.